thank you to everyone who is joining in today uh, to our second webinar of our 2022 sixth webinar season. We're so happy that we have Dr. Paula Rochon with us who is presenting. And I'm certain that many of you know her name very well. My name is Joanne Murphy and I'm chair of the RTO ERO Foundation Board of Directors. The mission of the RTO ERO Foundation is to invest in programs, research and training to support healthy active aging for all Canadians. Our activities aim to improve seniors' health care and social isolation and combat ageism. We envision a society in which all seniors live with dignity and respect. Before we get started, I'd like to deliver our land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge, recognize, and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work and the contributions of all Indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. Nous reconnaissons et honorons les territoires traditionnels ancestraux sur lesquels nous vivons et travaillons, ainsi que la contribution de tous les peuples autochtones à nos communautés et à notre nation. Merci, thank you, miigwech. Today's webinar will follow our usual format. Dr. Rochon will pre present for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. When we get to the discussion section after the presentation, we'll ask you to type your questions into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as possible. Today is the first time a foundation webinar will include slides in both official languages, English and French. We're so excited to have added this feature to our webinars and hope that you enjoy the chance to read the information in both languages. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Paula Rochon, whose presentation today is titled Optimizing Medication Safety. I know that if you've been following the RTO ERO Foundation, you'll be quite familiar with Dr. Rochon and her work. She's a frequent guest presenter on our webinars and also makes important contributions to the foundation's newsletter, blogs, and other communications with our donors and RTO ERO members. Dr. Paula Rochon is a geriatrician, founding director of Women's Age Lab, and a senior scientist at Women's College Research Institute. She is also the inaugural RTO ERO chair in geriatric medicine at the University of Toronto and is in her second term. Her research career focuses on understanding the unique needs of older adults, particularly women. She's one of the leading Canadian health services researchers in ger geriatric medicine. Dr. Rochon, thank you so much for taking time for our hectic schedule to join us today. And I will now turn the presentation over to you. So thank you so much, uh, Joanne, for that introduction. And I'm delighted to be here today uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Women's Age Lab and the idea of optimizing medications. All right, so um, the goals of the presentation today is I wanna first provide you an overview of Women's Age Lab and talk a little bit about the progress we've made. Uh, and then I wanna explore the importance of optimizing medication management. This is you know, such a big issue and such an important topic. So we wanna focus in on that and really discuss today opportunities to put this work uh, into practice. So I wanted to, when we think about Women's Age Lab, you know, it's, it's important and you know, kind of hard to imagine that we're actually the first and only center of its kind uh, that's focusing on improving the lives of older women and basing that on science. You know, you know when you think about the demographics out there, the fact that, you know, in Canada, about 20% of our population will soon be over the age of 65 and the majority of those people are women. It's hard to believe that there hasn't been another research center focusing on older women in Canada or our, to our knowledge uh, in the world. So we are the first, as far as we know, we did officially launch on uh, October 1st. 
Um, and so it's a, a really important, um, really important center. And one thing I'll just note is that when you focus on women, you also learn a lot about men. Uh, so it's, it's a benefit to women and men. So just to remind you a little bit about um, Women's Age Lab and some of our strategic objectives, you know, one of the things that we're doing from a science perspective is science is fundamental to everything that we do. So that's kind of the foundation piece and something that, you know, we've always uh, been doing work related to older adults and older women in particular. But what's different here is we're, we're doing the idea of no do act. You know, we're taking the science and then we're taking that science and putting it into action. So we're actually uh, finding ways to look at scalable ways that it could be applied in, in real life settings. And then we're doing the act part, which is really taking stories where appropriate to raise awareness about the work that we're doing. And this, the overall piece around here is that it'll lead to better health and social care uh, for older women in particular. So that's kind of the, our, our strategic objectives and how we're approaching them for Women's Age Lab. Now, when you think about, when we thought about Women's Age Lab, when we go from looking at aging broadly and focusing in on women, you know, it already feels like we have a pretty important focus. But I think you could all imagine that this is still a huge area. You know, there's so, just about everything that we look at, there's important uh, differences between women and men and older and younger people that come into play. So we needed, when we were thinking about Women's Age Lab, to develop areas of focus. And so we've done that, and we've focused in on areas that really align with a lot of the work that we're doing. So one of the pieces that we're focusing on is the idea of, of looking here at reimagining aging in place. Uh, so just thinking differently about the way we all want to age and also focusing in on the idea of congregate care, which is really long-term care. We are also talking about optimizing therapies and medications, which is what we're going to focus on today. And another piece that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about is the idea of promoting social connections. You know, the, how do you do this in order to prevent loneliness, which is uh, such a big issue for so many uh, people right now, especially during COVID. So another area of our focus. And underlying, crossing through these things is the idea of gendered ageism. You know, why is it that, you know, women are still uh, left out, especially older women, and aren't getting the consideration that they need? And so gendered ageism is something that we really need to address and challenge. Now, throughout the work that we're doing at Women's Age Lab, we're raising the importance of looking at data that's disaggregated by sex and age. So this is something that is, uh, is important for us to think about because by doing this, you learn not only about women uh, relative to men, but you're looking at older people relative to younger people and you learn a lot more information. So it becomes really valuable. So that's a key piece that we're gonna talk about today as we look at medications and just something to keep in mind in a lot of your own uh, work and your own thinking. At the bottom here, I wanna point out that the work that we're doing with Women's Age Lab is aligning with very important international initiatives. So for example, there's a global campaign right now to combat ageism, and that lines up with our work on addressing uh, gendered ageism. We're now in the decade of healthy aging, and all of our work is talking about, you know, how do you promote healthy aging, especially for women? So we're, we're very lined up with that. And this is work that's being led uh, by the WHO and the United Nations. And then a particular importance for today is this piece here around uh, medications. And there's a major initiative out there right now on the world stage uh, called Medication Without Harm. And we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that uh, in our conversation today. So that gives you a bit of a framework of uh, Women's Age Lab, uh, what we're doing in our priority areas. The idea that we're going to be focusing today on this issue around uh, optimizing therapies, optimizing uh, medications, and we will be looking at why it's so important to think about sex and age disaggregated data. So medications are certainly important. And I think we can all think of circumstances in our lives 
where medications have just made us feel so much better. Or in some cases, they've actually been life-saving. So I think without doubt, they're incredibly important. So I think that's, an, that's a starting point. But there's also, I think, room for improvement. And so our goal is really to find ways to optimize those medications, especially for older people and especially uh, for women. And as I just uh, mentioned, optimizing medications is uh, getting international attention. Uh, the, as, I, as I did say, the WHO has identified this idea of medication without harm as the focus of their major uh, patient safety challenge for this next little while. It, to sort of give you a sense of you know, how important this medication issue is, it was picked uh, by the WHO as just the third such challenge that they've taken on. So their first challenge was around issues like uh, cleanliness and that related to hand hygiene. The second issue that they took on was related to uh, making surgery safer. And they talked in particular about a surgical checklist. So medication safety is the next one because that has been identified as such an important issue uh, for us to think about worldwide. And when the WHO is approaching this, you know, one of the, the sort of their key uh, areas of sort of focus is engaging uh, patients and the public in this discussion so that they can all have a role and contribute. And that's really what we're doing here today. We're gonna to be have a, having a conversation about medications and engaging you in that uh, conversation. So within that um, area of, of the patient safety uh, or patient uh, conversation, there's a couple of areas that they're focusing on as well. One is the issue of polypharmacy and you know, reducing inappropriate polypharmacy. They also talk about uh, high risk situations and uh, issues around medications of transition of care. So those are things that you know, will come up as we talk about medications today. They certainly all fit with the idea of optimizing medications. But the one we'll probably talk about most relates to the idea of polypharmacy and how we can actually find ways to reduce polypharmacy. And I guess, you know, when you start talking about polypharmacy, people may say, you know, well, what do you mean by polypharmacy? You know, is that um, a number? Like, like what is it? Um, and so people define it in many different ways. There's a lot of different definitions of polypharmacy. But generally speaking, it's talking about using more medicines than are necessary. And people often use a cut point of say, five medications, some people use 10 medications. Um, so it's basically using uh, you know, a number of different medications and particularly medications that you may not um, currently need. And it's interesting that um, the WHO, in terms of one of their major objectives going forward for their campaign on medications without harm, is to reduce avoidable medication-related harm by 50% globally over a five-year time period. So pretty important piece and an, an aggressive uh, goal that they're undertaking. So to speak a little bit more about you know, medications and why they're important, you know, we can also think about this uh, from a financial perspective. You know, in Canada, we spend billions of dollars on prescription medications each year. You know, estimates that it's over 30 billion on uh, prescription medications. So that's, that's a lot. Another piece that I found interesting is that when we look at our overall healthcare spending, we are actually spending about the same amount of money on medications as we are on physicians who are providing the care. And you know, it's a large percentage of our healthcare spend, spending. So, you know, while as we've said, medications are really important, there's always room to do things a little bit better. And countries around the world are, are thinking about this and taking this on uh, as well. In the UK, uh, there was an interesting report that came out within uh, primary care that said that they thought about 10% of the prescriptions 
uh, that you know people are getting may not still be needed in the same way. And I, I think when you're looking at the um, the amount that we're spending on drug therapies, that's a, that's a, a large amount of um, prescriptions where there could be revisions and certainly a lot of uh, funds that are going in that regard. Also thinking about the importance of medications, and so many of these things are coming forward just you know right now in real time. But uh, I, I know a number of you would have watched um, Biden give in the United States, uh, his State of the Union. And it was interesting to know that issues of importance to older people and medications were included in his uh, comments. Uh, and they're really talking about in the United States, a plan to reinforce what they're calling safeguards to reduce the use of unnecessary medications and uh, to make sure um, that medications are used you know, appropriately whenever uh, possible and to avoid uh, inappropriate diagnosis and prescribing that still probably does occur. And here in Canada, it's also uh, becoming fairly top of mind because you would have heard also that there's talk about um, wanting to again pursue a national pharmacare program. And again, this is important because, you know, obviously drugs are so essential to the care that we all get. Um, but, you know, we know that people over the age of 65 in Canada have their drugs provided, but drugs are important for everyone. And so with a, a national pharmacare program, hopefully the idea would be to make drugs available to everyone in the country who needs them. And also they're thinking about, you know, practical things when you have a national program, you know, how could it be that you can go between provinces and still get your medication? So that's really helpful for practical purposes like travel as an example. And then obviously um, the thought is that if you are looking at drugs at a national level, there's an opportunity to reduce cost. So that's something that's uh, also important. So let's look a little bit more about um, women and medications and uh, medications in, in our context here in, in Canada. So I, I love this visual. It talks about um, older people. And it's interesting to say that two out of three uh, older people are currently getting five or more uh, prescription drugs over the course of a year. And one in four are actually getting 10 or more prescription drugs over the course of a year. So those are you know, quite a number of people who are, um, getting a lot of different medications. And it's also interesting to know that chronic use of what we're calling potentially inappropriate medications are highest among women and in particular amongst older women. So this relates again to our interest at Women's Age Lab and what are some of the particular issues that are important to older women. So why, why might that be? So one of the reasons it might be that women relative to men uh, are more likely to have chronic conditions and may need these medications to treat those chronic conditions. And so that may account for some of the increased medication use. But it's also older women that are more likely to be getting some inappropriate uh, prescriptions. And so this is something where we need to pay particular attention. And also older women are more at risk for drug side effects or adverse events. And so we want to also look carefully at this uh, when we're uh, reviewing our, our, uh, our medications. Now, when you're thinking about um, something like the work that we're doing here at Women's Age Lab, it's so important to find ways to engage uh, people, older people, patients in this whole process. And it's important that their voices are heard and that they bring forward issues that are gonna be very helpful to us as we, uh, as we think about our priorities going forward. And we've certainly had uh, the opportunity to talk to patients uh, through our focus groups done with you, the RTOERO. Uh, those focus groups have been so valuable in providing all sorts of insights. And we've also been able to have interviews with uh, older women as well. And through this, uh, we've learned some really interesting things. 
you know, one of the quotes that we got was around the issue of um, polypharmacy. And it, it says here, uh, I only take one pill. I took three and I talked to my doctor into getting me off two. I said, I really don't think I need to be taking this. And she said, I agree. So here's sort of the idea of a person who was on several medications, didn't really feel that they were helpful, went to her physician and, and got, um, you know, had a discussion about it, was able to have a conversation to determine what she needed to be on. And in this case, they were able to decrease some of the medications. But that's the kind of story that we do hear uh, from people and we have heard uh, uh, from uh, people like you. So thank you for that information. Uh, another quote that we have here, um, which has also been helpful, and I think also is very kind of uh, insightful. It says, we'll have lots, we all have lots of specialists, a lot of, a lot, a lot of different people kind of in the mix, you know, having uh, everyone on the same page is important. And I like this because it talks about, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated now you know, in terms of prescribing. You know, you may be getting uh, medications from your primary care provider. You might get referred to a specialist and there may be prescriptions coming through there that are coordinated with your primary care provider. Or perhaps you went to an emergency room and you got a script there. But there could be a variety of different people involved in that prescribing process. And so it is important, as this uh, individual has rightfully said, to get people on the same page. I think I've mentioned um, that, you know, that this issue about how do we improve drug prescribing isn't just one uh, that's relevant to us here today and in the work that we're doing through Women's Age Lab, but very much an international issue. Um, it's also one where we've had an amazing opportunity to work with an international group who share the, the concerns that we have about drug prescribing and are working with us to find ways to optimize prescribing. So in this particular group, uh, we're working with people from six different countries. So people who are from Ireland, from Belgium, uh, from the United States, Italy, Canada, and Israel, who all, uh, as I say, are interested in how do they uh, prescribe better for the older adults that they care for. And this project uh, that we're working on allows us to come together and hear about what's similar and what's different uh, in those different countries. So it's been incredibly uh, valuable and a chance uh, to really connect with people around the world. Now, as, I've, as we've been saying, this project is aimed to optimize prescribing by reducing the use of inappropriate medications. One of the unique things is we're exploring how sex differences, so biologic differences between women and men, and gender differences, the sociocultural pieces like um, income or poverty or all sorts of other kinds of cultural pieces that come into play can actually also impact prescribing and how we can incorporate that into our thinking as we find ways uh, to optimize prescribing. And throughout the work that we're doing uh, with this international team, we may be using very, very different types of data, but we're in, in all the data that we're using, we're making a point of looking at how do we disaggregate the data by sex and age to look at commonalities and to learn more uh, from the, the information that we have. And I'll illustrate this um, in this next piece. So here's an example of some uh, basic data that we have related to women and men in our province, and we'll tie it into uh, drug prescribing. So if we start uh, looking here, this is looking at uh, older women and men in Ontario. And at the top, you'll see that the number is about two and a half million. So that sort of is to alert you to the fact that there's about two and a half million people now in Ontario who are over the age of 65. That's a big number. When you look here further, the overall breakdown by women and men, you see it's not hugely different. More women than men, about 54% women. But let's look at what happens when you look across age groups. So you're going from younger, older adults, those who are 65 
uh, to 74 to people who are in the older age groups who are 85 plus and you know 100 plus so people who are much much older you'll see that the numbers of people go down but you'll also see that the distribution of women and men change so when you get when you start out at the younger age group about 53 percent are women but when you get into the older age group about 61 percent are women so just by looking at that simple demographic piece by age and by sex, we learn a lot more information than just looking at one piece alone. And let's look at this piece. And these data are coming from uh, information that we're getting uh, from uh, Ontario using our provincial data sets. And here you can see uh, what we're looking at is, uh, we're looking at, uh, sex and age differences here. So let's look, and we're looking at trying to get at some of the, what we're calling some of the pieces that relate to gender. And one of them is income. We know that women, for example, are more likely to be poor. So let's see how that kind of plays out when we're looking at, we're looking at different age groups. So overall, uh, you can see here that there's a percentage of people uh, that are considered to be poor. So that's in sort of the mid-teens. Overall, you can see it's a bit higher in women than men. So it's about 15% in men and about maybe about say 10, 11%, I'm sorry, it's about 15% in women and about 10 and 11% in men. But let's see what happens across age. So as we get from younger to older age groups, the number of people who are experiencing um, poverty or have low incomes increases. And you can see here, while we see in the blue bars, you see the overall numbers going up. When you look specifically at differences between women in the orange and men, you see the difference increases the most in the older age groups. Uh, so again, you can, you can tell uh, that when you're, you're going here from women you know, earlier on, maybe having about um, a much lower percentage of people who are poor, you know, in the 65 year old age group, you know, maybe it's in the mid teens and you go up here into the oldest age group and for women, it's, it's in the, you know, the 20 odd percentage. So it really changes. So this again shows you why it's important to look at these differences. Let's look at then uh, what, what happens here uh, when you're looking at use of medications. So one of the things that's clear, and again, we're looking at overall use here, and you don't really see a huge amount of difference between uh, women in the orange and men in terms of the numbers of medications they take. You know, here we're looking at, on average, people are taking maybe about four medications. But if we go across age groups, you see that those numbers increase. So it's lower in the 65-year-old age group and higher in those who are over the age of 85. And interestingly, you know, when you're looking at differences between women and men, you know, men look like they're taking a few more medications than women, but differences appear to be fairly similar in this, uh, in the older age group, but something that we need to explore more. And there is a thought that medication use is maybe fairly similar amongst the old, older uh, age groups, but the difference is in uh, the likelihood of developing adverse events and use of potentially inappropriate medications and those being higher in women, older women um, than men. So let's uh, just look at that a little bit more. Uh, we know some interesting examples that have been out there that have talked about uh, adverse drug events and them being more common in women. It comes from different kinds of evidence and sometimes it's helpful to put this information together. One piece of evidence that I, I thought was really interesting uh, comes from the US. And it points to the fact that adverse drug events are more common in women uh, than in men. And the, the reason this came out is they looked at drugs, uh, prescription drugs in the United States uh, between uh, a, a period of time, 1997 and 2000, that were withdrawn from the market because of adverse events. And what they show here is that eight of the 10 prescription drugs that were withdrawn were uh, drugs that had a greater impact on women than on men. So it sort of shows that, that these adverse drug events were uh, particularly problematic for women and speaks to that point. There's also an example that you might've heard of, uh, which is widely used to talk about 
why we need to think about women and men uh, separately when we think about drug prescribing relates to the example of a drug called Zolpidem, which is a sleep uh, medication. And these medications are used primarily by women. And they're also probably more likely to be used by older women. But it was interesting that these drugs were on the market for two decades, you know, being used by millions of people before data came out that showed that women were at a greater risk of having adverse events than men. And this was because they were found to be drowsier in the morning after taking the drug and drowsy to the point that they really couldn't drive. Uh, and so this led to, after this drug being on, out in the market for a long time, that it, the decision was made that a lower dose should be available for women and recommended for women than was prescribed for men. So it speaks to the issue of women um, perhaps needing different doses, maybe needing lower amo amounts of a drug to prevent side effects. And this would be magnified uh, for older women. So let's turn to some of the work uh, that we have been doing uh, that relates to getting at how can we make people aware of unnecessary prescribing and think about ways uh, that they might want to reduce this unnecessary prescribing. So one of the pieces we've talked about have been our, our prescribing cascades. They're important because they contribute to over-prescribing that leads to uh, polypharmacy. Uh, and basically what it is, is when you're prescribing a drug, when a new medical condition develops that's misinterpreted as a drug side effect and you get another drug. Now, this is something that I saw firsthand when uh, working in long-term care, uh, when uh, you know, people are on a lot of different medications and you were able to see people over time and see some of these things develop that otherwise you might not necessarily see. So here's how it works. You get a drug, a new medical condition develops and uh, you get another drug to treat that condition because people don't connect the fact that it was potentially related to that first drug. So here's an example. You might be taking a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, the kind of drug that people use a lot for uh, pain, arthritis pain, things like that. But people may not be so aware that that drug over time could contribute to elevating blood pressure. And that could lead to a physician seeing somebody measuring their blood pressure, thinking they have a, a blood pressure problem and starting a new medication to treat the blood pressure. And uh, that happens or, you know, can happen uh, fairly frequently, you know, which means that it's very important to always think about whether that new medical condition could be related to that drug therapy. So something uh, important uh, to think about. Uh, and, you know, when we started um, looking at these, you know, we, we weren't sure why they were so frequent uh, or why we thought they might be frequent, but part of it is that these side effects develop uh, in weeks and months. They don't happen immediately. And they're not recognized as being like a classic drug side effect. It's not like you took a drug and developed a rash and people connect the dots. They don't necessarily make the connection. And it can also be confused with age-related changes. You know, blood pressure is a problem that happens uh, with age. And so it may just be thought that, you know, it's something that's not unexpected. Uh, our work on uh, prescribing cascades has been uh, talked about a lot. And it's important because it's helped people think about areas where there is potentially inappropriate prescribing. And it might be a way to help people uh, think about reducing polypharmacy. It's been talked about uh, in articles published in the New York Times, read by a lot of people and generating a lot of conversation. And it's in, a, in also a really interesting book called Elderhood. If you have a chance uh, to read it, I think I've mentioned it before, written by a geriatrician, but it talks about a lot of uh, important things around aging. And one of them you know, is to talk about the prescribing uh, cascades. They have a chapter describing that and how it impacts people. Just wanted to also say that um, we have, uh, for our work on prescribing, received funding uh, from the federal government to support the work that we're doing, uh, because I think they recognize too how things like 
uh, thinking about optimizing prescribing and thinking about simple pieces like prescribing cascades can help us reduce unnecessary uh, drug prescribing, reduce polypharmacy, and help to contribute to optimizing uh, prescribing. And important to note that the RTO ERO are uh, working with us as uh, collaborators and have been really important um, contributors in helping us to think through uh, these projects and how to make sure that they're as relevant as possible um, to uh, patients and people out there in the community. Some of the work that we've done, uh, we've, we've tried to find ways to make it kind of practical and useful. And so one of the pieces we wrote, which I quite liked was um, five things to know about uh, prescribing cascades to get people attuned uh, to these issues. So the first thing we just talked about a prescribing cascade is when an adverse drug event is misinterpreted as a new condition leading to another drug that was potentially uh, avoidable and maybe didn't need to be added. And they can be um, lead to problems like people having to go to the emergency room or to the hospital. Uh, so they are important. And as we've said, they do contribute to this idea of uh, inappropriate polypharmacy drugs you don't necessarily need to take and maybe you know, could be stopped. Uh, and you know, cascades can be identified in this, this polypharmacy uh, potentially prevented. Even if you think about it, you can anticipate this and prevent that problem from happening and uh, provides an opportunity to help people when you're thinking about which drugs are needed and maybe which drugs not so much, uh, where, to, um, where to look and which drugs you wanna explore further as part of that process. We've had some really interesting uh, feedback from um, uh, people like your members on things that are important. This one was, was good. It says, um, when you get older, you get given a lot of different medicines by a bunch of different doctors. And there's quite often side effects. And the one doctor doesn't know what the other doctor has given. So the two doctors, the side effects sort of double. Uh, and I think this speaks about how these um, you know, prescribing pieces can go forward that um, you know, are, are potentially opportunities where people can be empowered to you know, raise questions and ask and um, people can have their meds reviewed. So I thought it would be good to talk about some really practical things uh, that you can do uh, to help make sure that you, your medications and those around you uh, are, are optimal. So one of the things uh, which I think is really helpful is to always bring all of your medications and just put them in a brown paper bag, bring them all to your appointment. And it's not just those ones that are prescribed. And I think in this picture here, you'll see that these are all, you know, kind of prescribed medications, but also those things that you buy yourself, the things you get at the drugstore, the over-the-counters, you know, different medications like that, because they count. So you want to bring those with you uh, to your appointment uh, so that people are aware of what you're actually taking. And this is a piece of information that we think is really important and it may seem really simple, but I think it's really helpful. For each drug you take or people that you are caring for take, I think it's important to know a couple of different things, just three pieces of information. I think it's important to know about each of the drugs, when a drug was started, why it was started, and who started it. You know, so for example, when you, you, know, you think about um, the prescribing cascades that we talked about, you know, if you knew the sequence of the drug prescribing, it might help to identify when it was actually a cascade. But also some of these drugs have been started many, 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 many years ago. And it's, also, it's often important to continue to reevaluate. And you need to know why it was started. Was it for something really minor? Was it for a major problem? Like what was the reason that it was started? And sometimes for these drugs that were started years ago, sometimes decades ago, people don't always remember. So it's important to have that information. And then also who started it? You know, was it your primary care doctor? Was it when you saw a specialist, when you were in the emergency room? Like, you know, who was it that started those medications? And I think that's very, very helpful for you to know and also for um, your prescribers to know as well. 
We also put together uh, some questions to help uh, patients look at their medications and even to identify things like prescribing cascades or how polypharmacy might have uh, come forward. And I find these questions are also just helpful for conversations that you might have about your medicines. So one of the questions is, am I experiencing a symptom that could be a drug side effect? You know, so that's a reasonable question to ask. Is there a new drug being used to treat uh, a side effect from a drug I'm already taking? So uh, again, something you can ask. Is a safer drug available or could I be taking a lower dose? And this is a, a, you know, an important question, especially over time and as people uh, get older where doses may need to be adjusted. And then the last question relates to, do I really need this drug at all? To go back to the beginning, we know that drugs are incredibly important and many drugs you absolutely will always need. But in some cases, there may be other alternatives that you could explore. Uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, maybe for some uh, mild um, joint problems, you know, maybe exercise could be helpful as an example. So there's simple things that you could do in addition to your meds or in some cases instead of your meds. But these are important uh, questions that you might want to ask that might be helpful. Um, another piece to think about is it's really important to have your medications reviewed uh, and those for people that you might care for. And there are programs out there that you uh, could access that might be helpful to you. So one is a meds check program and you can work with your, have this coordinated you know, through your doctor, but it is an opportunity to sit down and just talk about your medications. You know, it's a one-on-one -on -one interview um, with a pharmacist and it's an opportunity um, to, you know, to look at each of your medications and um, figure out how they work together and identify any potential side effects and maybe give you some advice on how best to take these medications. And most important, probably it's an opportunity just to ask questions. So something that I, I would um, think is really important and something that we uh, would advise that you can do uh, with your uh, primary care provider that could be quite helpful. And uh, you know, we're talking a lot about what you can do as patients, but we've also done work with our international um, uh, collaborators from these six different countries to think about what are some guidance that we can give to physicians to help them uh, optimize the medications that they're prescribing for their older patients. And we created this uh, acronym, it's called DRUGS, D-R-U-G-S, and uh, to help uh, physicians with, uh, with some of those thinking as they go through um, medications review and as they're working to optimize medications. So the D is to discuss the goals of care and what matters to the patients, what their priorities are. The R is to review medications. The U is to use tools and frameworks, and there's some excellent guidance out there to help uh, look at um, different medications and how they are, can be optimized for people. Uh, the geriatric medication approach, uh, which is you're just taking a very holistic approach approach to, to prescribing, not just focusing on a single condition, thinking about multiple conditions and how things interact. And then the last piece on this uh, drugs piece is in some cases, it's important to decrease doses or even in some cases, stop medications and to, to sort of think about that as well. And so we've uh, written this guidance to help um, prescribers internationally uh, optimize the medications that they're prescribing for their patients. So to sort of um, sum up here, you know, medications clearly have been crucial in improving uh, our lives just in so many different ways. Uh, and they've been life-saving as well. So they're certainly very important. But I think you've seen that the idea of reducing drug harm is a global priority. And things like the work that we're doing on optimizing prescribing, the pieces that we've brought forward internationally related to prescribing cascades all contribute to this idea about how do we reduce unnecessary um, polypharmacy and unnecessary use of medications when that's needed. And really uh, this work is important because it raises awareness among patients and people in the community like yourselves, as well as healthcare providers about you know, what they might uh, want to think about and uh, some of the questions that they might 
want to ask. So with that, I, I want to, of course, uh, thank all of you for joining uh, this webinar today. Thank you, of course, to the RTO ERO for your ongoing support and your support of this chair uh, that helps make this work possible. Uh, that's so valuable. And then, of course, thank you so much to my Women's Age Lab team. That is just amazing. And they're always uh, here to help uh, with these presentations. Uh, they're here with me as well uh, today. And uh, they're, you know, couldn't do this work without them. So thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rochelle. What an interesting uh, presentation. You've offered us a lot of uh, things to consider, especially when we go to visit our own doctors. And I was happy to see that at the very end of your presentation, you talked about tips for us as the patient, but you also uh, presented a way for a doctor to double check and make sure that um, you're receiving the right medication and not really more than you should be taking. So great, thank you, so interesting. We are going to open up the uh, Q&A portion of the webinar now. So I remind you that we are only taking the questions that are in the Q&A box. Uh, we won't have time for all those questions and uh, the ones that are in the chat box will not be answered. Sorry about that. Um, I have a question here that I would like to present. How do we address the disconnectedness in our medical system? Example, when information like drug reactions, allergies are on your record, but the next doctor or technician doesn't read it, or when three different doctors prescribe strong antibiotics in a short time, but no one follows up to check for related problems. So that's a that's a really uh, that's a really important uh, question. Thank you so much for raising that. But it, it is this idea about how we. I think it's been brought up in some of the quotes that were um, brought forward by some of the RTOERO members. It's this idea about there being a bit of a disconnect and people not always having the information that you might expect them to have. So we do have you know electronic records which are helpful, uh, but we know that those those systems aren't always perfect. So that's where I, I think one of those pieces that I was suggesting is, is something that you can do that can also be helpful and can add, which is you know, keeping track of your own uh, medications um, so that you, know, you have information about your medications and why they were started and uh, who started them. And those sorts of bits of information can be really, really helpful. So I know that obviously there's um, a number of different systems in place, uh, but I do think it's also helpful for patients to keep some of those records as well and to be very familiar with the medications that they're on. Thank you. Uh, here's another question uh, that is an interesting one. Has there been discussion about how pills and drugs are presented to older patients? The packaging and instructions can be confusing for those over 85. So again, another uh, important question. And I think that speaks to the importance of including older people in the process of some of these different developments, because I think what you've said makes a lot of sense. This packaging is incredibly confusing. Even for example, if you think about prescription bottles, you know, if people are using those, it's really hard to kind of understand or even to be able to sometimes read that information. So it's not being done in necessarily a user-friendly way. And I think there's a lot that we could do to make that um, you know, much easier for people to understand. Uh, because clearly it's also important that people take the, way, the medications in the way uh, that they're intended. And if you don't provide the instructions in a clear way, uh, you know, that's really difficult to do. So I think that's an important piece and I agree with you. I don't think we've done enough in that area, but a lot more needs to be done there. Thank you. Women in general and older women in particular are often treated dismissively by medical professionals. How do we address this without creating an adversarial situation? So that gets into, I think, one of the, uh, the areas that I've talked about, you know, and one of the reasons why we've 
started Women's Age Lab. You know, that often women, you know, I guess the word has been a little bit thought of as being a bit invisible, that they haven't necessarily had the attention um, that they should have, and they sort of get missed out. You know, it, it, it happens in a number of different levels. You know, one of the things we've talked about in, in prior presentations is, for example, it wasn't until the 90s that women needed to be included in clinical trials in the United States. And it wasn't until, you know, even more recently, just a couple of years ago, that older adults needed to be included in those trials. So even information about uh, women was not readily available. So I, I think it's important, uh, and that's also relates to the idea of, you know, this idea of challenging gendered ageism, discrimination based on not only your age, but your sex. And I think we all agree that that's completely unacceptable and it impacts people's health. So, you know, it is important for everyone and women and all the people around them to speak up and make sure that your voices are being heard at an individual level, but also to think about what we need to do at a community and policy type level to make sure that that's happening. Thank you. Is the research data on prescribing cascades being used in Canadian medical schools? How is the significant information being shared with practicing family physicians? So this information is being shared, I think not just in Canada, but around the world. And one of the places I see it being shared is uh, often in uh, medication review guidance that is given out, you know, like the piece that I showed you for that drugs um, uh, guide to optimizing prescribing. You know, pieces like that include prescribing cascades in them. And when people are thinking about medications to de-prescribe and looking at what they call de-prescribing algorithms, which means what are the meds you want to target where you might want to decrease a dose or in some cases stop the medications. In many of those uh, algorithms that are used around the world, prescribing cascades are included. So they'll say, you know, one of the drugs you ought to target for uh, potentially drugs that maybe are no longer uh, needed at the same dose or maybe could be stopped are drugs that are part of prescribing cascades where a drug is being used to treat um, the side effect of another uh, medication. So I think that's one way it's getting out there. And I but it's, it's just good to talk about it and have people like um, people in the community and in particular patients to bring forward these, these issues. And that's why you know, those questions for patients to ask are important. You know, I think the more people bring this forward and the more people think about it, um, you know, uh, people pay attention. Okay, another question. I photographed the screen of questions to ask you, doctor. Is it okay for me to share that on our district Facebook page? For sure. And I think um, we published um, a, a number of those pieces and I think um, the links to some of those publications will be made available. Uh, so yes, that's exactly the sort of um, information that we wanna make sure people have. And I, I think we've tried to create some sort of pieces that are fairly, I hope user friendly. So if you like the way the slide looked, that's great. Okay, how do we determine who, why, and when a drug started? How do you determine that? Yes. Well, I think that's part of the, the thing to think about that sometimes it's hard to remember. Like for example, you know, a person who, you know, is maybe into their eighties may have been on a medication for decades and maybe they don't remember those pieces and, you know, it, it's hard to remember that kind of information. But what I think we can do is going forward when a new medicine is being started, that's where I think in particular, you wanna start tracking that information so that you have it going forward in the future. And you can, you know, that's helpful information to have when your medicines are being reviewed. You know, it's really helpful for your physician to have, you know, just at their fingertips or the pharmacist to have or whatever, recognizing they may also have that information, but. It's important, you know, I think it's helpful if you have it as well. Thank you. What about supplements and vitamins? There are many supplements like D3 and calcium uh, that are prescribed. And I was surprised that some of these things actually react to prescription drugs. You so, yeah, I think that's really important. So it's not just um, 
you know, these are what I call over the counter things, right? So, you know, vitamins and pieces like that. And I'm sure many of us are taking different kinds of vitamins, uh, you know, and that's great. But uh, there's also other kinds of medicines that people take, like, you know, different kinds of maybe herbal medicines or other sorts of things. But it's important to know that all of these are in essence drugs and they can interact. So that's why I say that brown paper bag thing is a good thing. Whatever you take, put your medicines or your over-the-counters or your uh, alternative medicines that you're taking in, in that bag and bring that as part of your discussion about your medicines because they, they are interactions. And I think sometimes people think that just because you, you know, get things over the counter or they're you know, natural, that they don't potentially also interact or potentially have side effects. Um, so it's important to um, very much consider those. In 1994, we began to test drugs on women. Is this still the case? Yes. So women are required to be included in uh, clinical trials now. And that's really uh, obviously important uh, because I think, you know, just even and even some of the data I was showing about demographics and uh, pieces around drug use, you know, there's differences between uh, women and men. And it's really important that we are thinking about those from the outset. And there's also important differences that with age. And so that intersection of older women, older men, and these differences are really important uh, to make sure that we're always thinking about. Thank you. What sources do you recommend to learn about the side effects of the drug and their pre uh, prevalence? Well, I mean, you know, people, a lot of people go to, you know, Google and places like that. But I think, you know, the this is something that's really important that you want to make sure you're talking about on a regular basis when you're meeting with your primary care physician. But that's also where things like the meds check come in, you know, because that's where you're dealing with somebody, you know, a pharmacist or a provider, somebody who has a lot of experience with medications and can really help put it in your context. So those I think are your, are some of the best resources that you can use. And that's why I brought forward the idea of meds check as well. Thank you. Is anyone examining the way pharmaceutical companies and salespeople to physicians to physician's office to convince them to try out new meds on their patients. I was shocked to learn that sales reps with no medical or pharmaceutical training can be the very reps meeting with physicians and convincing them to try out these new meds, including free samples to be given out. So that's a whole different topic, another kind of area of discussion. Um, and there was or has been a lot of concern about influence on prescribing from uh, pharmaceutical companies. One of the things I'd like to note is that uh, there's been huge efforts made uh, to, to make sure that that's not happening, uh, especially in the academic environment. So, you know, the, the work that we do here is not, uh, you know, supported directly through that kind of um, approach. So, so there, everything has to be kept at an arm's length so that you're not um, being directly influenced by somebody saying, you know, hey, let's just try this with your patients. So that's not happening in our environment. Um, I recognize that's something that did happen in the past and ha has happened in other environments, but not in the academic environment. Thank you. How too often drugs treat the symptoms and not the cause, why not go to the source of the problem? So yes, I, I totally agree that um, you want to find out what the underlying problem is as much as possible and try to, um, to manage that and treat that as much as possible. And that's why I also said that sometimes, you know, medications may be helpful, but there may be other things that people need to think about. You know, maybe it relates to um, diet, which is so important uh, to maintaining your health, or maybe it relates to um, exercise that you could be doing that's helpful. So yes, I think wherever possible, you want to go to, to the cause and try to address that, but sometimes you can't. And it's in that case, it's really important to find ways to manage the symptoms. I believe this will be uh, one of our last questions. 
Should seniors be concerned of interactions between herbal rem remedies and drugs prescribed by doctors? Yes. Um, like, as I say, everything, um, all these different things are in fact uh, medications and they do have interactions. And it's really important um, to make sure that that information is brought to the attention of your physician and your pharmacist so that they're aware and they can uh, potentially alert you to any potential interactions and give you advice. I mean, there's been a whole um, uh, amount of research that's been done uh, in terms of uh, looking at some of these other forms of therapies and understanding how they work so we know as much as possible about them, but there's a lot more uh, that we need to learn. But yes, I think uh, as, as we were saying, whatever you're taking, whether it's over the counter or other kinds of uh, medications or prescribed medications, you need to look at all of them because they all potentially uh, could have interactions that would be important to know about. I'll squeeze in one more question. Why is it not possible for the information about medica medications prescribed by other health providers to be shared with your primary health provider? So I think it is shared. And for the most part, that information is there. Um, but it, sometimes it's just, it just maybe isn't sort of readily at hand or uh, for example, maybe you're not going back to your primary care physician, you're in an emergency room somewhere or some other setting, and it may not be as accessible as you'd like. So yes, that information is something your primary care doctor collects, and they do have that information. And, uh, and of course, they should have that information, but I, I still think it's also important for you as the patient to know the medicines that you're on and to have that information available as well. Well, Dr. Rochon, thank you so much. Um, this has been such an interesting presentation and great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer them all today, um, but I believe that Deanna is making a list of them and I'm not sure what will happen after that. But thank you to all of uh, the people who joined in today and to those of you who sent questions um, that Dr. Rochon answered. And I... Uh, Hope that you remember uh, the foundation is always here. Um, if you would like to support the foundation, you can reach us by phone or mail, which you're going to see on the screen any minute now, or you can visit us online to get more information about our work or to make a donation. I want to mention to everyone in attendance that a very short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webinar ends. Your feedback is very important to us. So please take just one minute to let us know how we did today. Again, from all in attendance today and from the RTO ERO Foundation, we want to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Paula Rochon for taking the time to share this excellent presentation and answer questions. Dr. Rochon, is there anything you'd like to add before we finish? No, I just want to say thank you so much. And thank you so much to the RTO ERO and all of your members who uh, helped so much and contributed so much to the work that we're doing. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be uh, able to present today. Thank you. Well, thank you. This concludes our webinar from the RTO ERO Foundation and our guest, Dr. Paula Rochon. Thank you again, everyone, and please stay healthy and safe. Stay tuned for the third webinar in a few weeks. Goodbye.